Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of the Globe Talks with Trader series, where you can learn the ins and outs of crypto trading. I'm your host Sunlight and today I'm delighted to welcome onto the show Bryce Gilliland, CEO at Asha Capital Partners. So watch on to find out about what a crypto fund of funds does and what makes them successful. So on to the interview. Hi Bryce, how are you? Hey, I'm doing great. How are you doing today? I'm great. Thank you. So how about you tell us a bit about yourself and how you got into crypto trading? Yeah. So I start with me and friends in college who are always into kind of economics, investment, and any of the opportunities out there. You know, we talk about bond rates, we talk about stock picks, we talk about where we think the economy is going. And then in early uh, 2014, we started getting a little bit interested in Bitcoin and kind of the digital uh, currency space. And then after a few years and knowing about some trading, we got started in 2016 and we started trading some friends and family um, money. And then I I remember I bought my first Ethereum at $2. Um, And so we just saw this huge opportunity set in the space and started growing it from there. And so, you know, one thing turned into another from uh, being interested in economics and finance to getting into this very, uh, volatile but growth oriented sector to uh, starting to kind of help friends and family your friends and family must love you <laughs> yeah we we've been able to make some you know very nice life-changing um amounts of uh, of wealth for people you know seeing friends be able to buy a house uh or you know buy a car and not worry about debt or payments on it um or you know be able to start their own business or kind of go off on a career path their own that's really what they love and what they're passionate about, as opposed to, you know, hey, I gotta, I gotta keep this job to pay the bills, but uh, I kind of, I kind of dredge it. So it's, you know, it's lovely to see that kind of the freedom and free spirit that it can enable. Absolutely. So this kind of turned from a friends and family thing to actually into a business. So Asha Capital, that's, this is not your first crypto fund. Um, so what made you decide to start Asha a year ago? And what are you doing differently now um, compared to w- what you were doing at Coincident Capital? Yeah, so at Coincident, we had a specific strategy. It's a long short trading strategy. Um, and really, it's not kind of long short in the typical equity sense as you're long some fund, uh, some um, stocks and you're short others. It's long short in the the sense that you're either long crypto or you're short crypto. Um, Mm -hmm. So very binary. Um, And then, so that's a very specific strategy. It performed very well. And then we were, um, we were oversized in, uh, in coincident. And so we stopped being able to fundraise and therefore stopped being able to bring some of the opportunity to friends and family or to others in the space. I still think the space, and I think everyone in this space agrees has so much opportunity. And so what Asha looks to do is to help bring that opportunity to others. And so as someone who ran a fund, it's really interesting to go out there and see a bunch of other funds, see a bunch of other smart fund managers, see what their strategies are and try to bring those to other people. And so that's what I love about Asha is I'm learning constantly. I'm seeing some of the best managers in the space, and then I'm able to share that with others. Awesome. So what are the core business lines at Asha? Yeah, so at Asha, we have really, I'd say, four key business lines. One is research, one is operations, um, portfolio, planning and management, and then fundraising. And um, I guess for research, it's really interesting. We go out, we, we look at a bunch of funds. We have a database of over 800 funds in the space that we've reached out to, that we have information on. And then we look at what the different strategies are. You know, some are looking at how are neural pathways and neural signals affecting trade and market movements. Some are arbitrage funds. Some are looking at, you know, core aspects like what's DeFi or what are security tokens looking like in the space. Um, and so it's just fascinating to see how diverse these strategies are and what these people are looking at. Um, operations, you know, to, to keep that one short is just, do you have quality partners? Do you have the right structure in place? Are you working with your LPs and customers in the right way that's, you know, serving their needs and hopefully being ahead of what they're looking for? Um, portfolio planning is probably the most difficult Part of it, you're looking at where you are in the market cycle, which is always a judgment call. Um, Though we think there's some very key technical indicators you can use to to judge that or base that off of. And then looking at what funds are gonna perform well and what managers are gonna manage that as well. Because you you can have managers that have a great strategy at one point in time, but aren't adjusting. And so it can turn turn poor pretty quickly if they're not uh, kind of staying on their toes. And then lastly is fundraising. And so fundraising is a little bit of the lifeblood of a hedge fund. 
But it's really, for me, what I see is an educational and sharing process where we're working with customers or LPs or potential people to tell them what's happening in the space. And so many people know of crypto or know of blockchain, but don't really know much about it. And so our job or my job in particular is to try to share, hey, here's what it is and here's the opportunity that it has. And you know, let me know if you have questions because there's no dumb questions. Right, Bryce. So could you tell us a bit about um, trading strategies that you employ yeah. So at Asha, we look at a variety of strategies and really we're trying to look at what strategy is going to work right now and for the next six or 12 months. So, you know, as your portfolio plans and you get to move it, you can't always do it on a month to month basis. You definitely can't do it on a day to day basis. And so, you know, looking at that long lead time. So like right now you're looking at market neutral strategies are going to be optimal. So can you find, you know, arbitrage strategies? Can you find some market, um, some market neutral, long, short, which are more algorithmic based? Can you find market making strategies that may still be profitable or low yield strategies that have really risk off behavior? Because um, as we've seen, you know, with Luna, it, even some, some seemingly risk free things are not risk free at all. Um, so there's that. And then we look at, you know, what are your fundamental long strategies or what are your long, short trader strategies that may be able to perform much better in a bull market or much better in a um, kind of more consistent and directional market. And then lastly, you know, there's some VC or early equity um, strategies that you can look at as well. There's a lot of like one-off strategies. Um, you know, we met one fund, I won't share their name, but they, they were just doing yield and coin farming. So every month they're just stacking coins and stacking more coins. And, you know, they, they would have some month that was like, negative 90 percent and then they'd have other months that were like 400 percent. so it was you know, the most volatile fund i've ever seen but really interesting to see the different strategies out there so there's a lot of little one-offs like that as well that's awesome that you take such a long-term um view on this because you know in a moment like anything can change especially in crypto so it's nice to see that there are more you know safer options out there yeah we like to think there's safer options then we like to think if you're seasoned in the space you can see a lot of this coming you know um while rare you know a lot of people and a, a few people i know at least in november december last year were saying hey you know this looks like it might be the top guys and many people were still thinking oh we have another run to 100k um but if you do see that you can you can really go what we're calling more risk off and be more careful because crypto has such exponential upside that if you can capture that upside and even just minimize some of the downside you're going to come out far ahead in the end. And so that's where, you know, everyone's afraid of it, but I think really, if you're gonna hit enough home runs, you can strike out a few times and still be significantly in the lead. Absolutely, it's what, what's so good about crypto, isn't it? You can lose so much, but then you can always just, you know, come back on top <laughs> eventually. <laughs> yeah, and if you can, you know, minimize the number of times you strike out, I don't, I don't know a good analogy outside of US sports, but uh, <laughs> you know, minimize the number of times you give up the ball, uh, then you're always going to stay in control. So I, I think that's that's where a lot of crypto funds and crypto traders and investors can really find more of an edge is, you know, once you get those gains, lock in those profits and then be cautious and have really good risk control. To use your analogy of, you know, minimizing the time times you strike out, how as a trader can you do that? Is it through experience or technical analysis? Yeah, so I'm a huge fan of technical analysis in general. I think you can see, you know, very clear support and resistance points, and then you can see market trends really well. And so, you know, if the trend starts going against you and crosses through what, you know, was a previous support line, then cut your losses. And, you know, that can be done pretty easily. And then you can wait until you see a significant uptrend again, um, or you can start shorting the market or playing on shorter time frames to do that. Uh, but in general, that, you know, is your own risk controls and your own risk system there. And so different funds do it differently. You know, some have like maximum stop losses. Uh, some have, you know, uh, real, real tight stop losses. Arbitrage funds are more defensive in general. And so depending on what your strategy is, you're going to have different risk controls. And then depending on what your risk appetite is, um, you know, most people who are in crypto are less risk averse than the average person just by the nature of you being in the sector. Um, but I think some of those people are the ones who, who need it the most, of course, you know, if you're, if you're less inclined to be risk controlled, then you should probably look at that, especially if you're trading. Um, and then what I find interesting is the dynamic of really risk averse people 
or really uh, defensive people trading in crypto. Anyone's like, how did that happen? But really what it is, is it's someone who's really smart in looking at the opportunity sector and then realizing that, you know, the way they lose is by not managing their risk, right? And so, you know, very opportunistic and very, um, I'd say measured, I don't want to say cautious, but, but very measured in what they're doing. Because if you're overly cautious, you won't even get in the sector and then you'll miss out on all of the upside. Absolutely. Thank you. So talking more on risk management, um, how do you make your selection on which funds to invest in as a fund of funds? Yeah. So as a fund of funds, you know, that's our, our job and part of our value proposition is saying, hey, what we do is we go out there and we research these funds. We have a huge database of funds. So you know, hopefully we know more funds than you. We're getting to know the funds earlier than you. And then when we do look at the funds, we're going really deep to see, are they are they doing everything we expect and do we think they can have an edge? And so in general, we're looking at strategy, risk management, the team operations and the future outlook. So I'll just like a quick blurb on each is strategies. Is it sustainable and do they have an edge? And is it an edge in the market as well as an edge over their competition? So, you know, for example, if you had five long short funds, which one's the best and why are they the best? And do we think they can maintain that status as the best? Um, risk management, is it prudent? Is it very specific and measurable? Um, do we understand what the system is? You know, a lot of managers will tell you one thing and then in actuality, their performance is much different where they're like, oh, you know, we decided we, we could take on more risk in this occasion. Well, why did you take on more risk there? Why is that? How is that acceptable? Um, and so very specific risk management controls. And then that leads into the team. I think if you're working with these managers and oftentimes we'll be on, you know, four or five, six calls with them before deciding to invest, uh, as well as doing you know, a lot of due diligence behind the scenes, then you can kind of gauge their personality, their attitude, their consistency, and then how risk on or risk off they are. You know, a lot of our I think, personal styles flow into more than just our work, but in how we interact with others as well. And so watching for that consistency and, you know, hearing their answers and then digging into their answers in looking at their fund and their research is to see if that's the same. And then also seeing, is that person someone who can change and adapt over time? Um, that, you know, the only constant in life is change. So can these guys stick with that, um, guys or girls? And, um, and then can they adapt to the changing environment of the space as well? You know, I think crypto being 24 seven, being cutting edge technology is changing faster than most sectors are. So how are they going to keep up with that? Um, and then the last part is just the standard legal structure. Do they have the right legal structure? Are they following the regulatory requirements? Do they have trusted third parties? Um, are they timely and um, consistent with their customers and LPs? Awesome. So what is the kind of fund, a crypto fund ecosystem like? It, it sounds quite cutthroat. Um, it's interesting. I, I feel like crypto has a very kind of friendly community vibe in a lot of ways. You know, there, there's different sectors to that. So I'll caveat that there are the, the crypto maxis, which are almost almost like anarchist like where they're like oh yeah you know this is the future and you know government money is so bad and terrible and you know you can hide your wealth here and you know you go too far down that route and that's dangerous <laughs> um but then there's the people who are like hey this is about us supporting each other and us finding a more sustainable way of living and you know, you know government entities and, and fiat has its purpose but it also has its shortcomings and maybe we can help move past those shortcomings with this and so that whole mentality really spreads to the sector. And so, you know, we've talked to hundreds of funds and most of them are very supportive and very helpful. And even people in the same sector that are, you know, competitors with each other can talk and strategize. So, you know, for me personally, I talk to several other fund to funds on a regular basis. We share who we think are good funds in the space, what we're seeing uh, at what the trends are, even where we see the market going, which is some of what, you know, I would say might be our distinct alpha over others. And then we see that other funds in the space can do some of those similar things. You know, uh, VC funds share deals all the time. You know, it's, it's hard to, we were looking at VC funds as an example, and it was hard to differentiate between some of them because they had so many shared deals. So we're like, hey, you know, if you pick half these, you're picking the same thing as the other, you know, as that 50%, you know, so finding the, the distinction there was hard. And then, you know, a lot of these people are sharing the same programmers um, or help on you know, what to build on. So I think it was about a year and a half ago, looking, in, I do some personal angel investing, looking at some of the deals, they were 
everyone's saying, oh, build on Solana and then you can you know, transfer it over to Ethereum and then you get your product up quickly. And then you can also meet different developers and future work staff. So it was interesting to see everyone in the space kind of sharing a lot of their information. I think the few people who don't are the traders in the space, which that, you know, that makes sense. That That is more of a cutthroat, you know, some person's winning, some person's losing the trade, generally speaking. Um, so I see that, but the, as a as a whole, the space is very collaborative. Absolutely. So you just talked about, you know, traders in the space. Uh, do you trade personally? I do. Yeah, I find it um, very interesting. I feel that it keeps me kind of in the market and in the day to day. And then, you know, uh, just as an aside, I, I might have uh, LPs that call me, you know, and, and want to ask questions. And, you know, a lot of them want to know what happened to Bitcoin's price yesterday or this morning, you know, and so I, I have to be pretty re ready to answer those questions or say, hey, you know, I haven't looked at it in the last hour. So let me let me go check on it. Um, but then also I see a lot of opportunity in the space. So yeah, I feel like it keeps me connected and grounded. Um, it's a constant skill development and learning process. And then it, um, yeah, it makes you see the correlation across the various markets and what's happening there. So I think in terms of portfolio planning, it really helps me and the team do that to be, uh, to be in touch and attuned with the market. So what are your favorite tokens at the moment and why? Oh, disclaimer, not financial or investment advice. <laughs> yeah, so I'm not going to shill anything um, <laughs> on, this, uh, on this call, but um, I generally don't follow tokens very closely. I find that with everything else in my life, um, I'm not going to be the expert following these tokens. And I think, you know, just as a kind of a principal perspective, if I'm not going to be able to find an edge in something, um, I, I probably shouldn't go into it too far. And so digging into all these tokens, you know, I can't kind of run a company and do some of my own trading and analysis and then dive deep on these tokens. Whereas if I can talk to people in the space who run some of these like token-based funds and get insight from them, I think that's you know much, much better and smarter of me to be able to go about it that way. Uh, but I follow, you know, Bitcoin and Ethereum just as the two major movers. And then as I can, um, you know, just get into other, other top coins as they become top coins, or if um, I have a few friends, I'd say like five or 10 that will feed me token names um, before they're mainstream. And then I'll dig into some of those briefly, but I'll, I'll again, get most of my data from those people first. <laughs> awesome. So talking a bit more about trends and everything in the blockchain industry, that always seems like a th a main theme each year. For example, last year was NFTs and this year seems like, you know, rage, everyone's raging for DAOs. What area of the blockchain industry do you think will be the next big thing? So for me, I still think it's DeFi in general, at least over a, a long enough time frame, a three to five year time frame. I feel like there is specific applications that can be replaced in TradFi with DeFi um, that we can move towards over the next you know, few years. Uh, I still believe that, you know, blockchain has arrived when you don't know you're using it. So when you're opening up your phone and you're opening up an app and the blockchain is interacting on the back end of that app between, you know, maybe your own wallet or, you know, a bank or the, the two systems or a website and a payment system, you know, whatever it is, when you're not integrating it or entering in a very long, you know, wallet address, then you're using the blockchain really effectively. And we, we've kind of arrived. And so I feel like DeFi um, is also the, like, the principal basis of Bitcoin to get away from our current uh, fiat system and all the layers of it. You know, as, um, as a college grad, you know, when I was graduating from college, well, some time ago, we won't go into the exact time, um, I wanted to look at the finance industry and so many of the jobs, I was like, what's the actual value of this? You know, like if you're a trader or an investment banker, you're moving around dollars to somewhere that might actually add value, to a company that might actually add value. And so I feel like there's so much um, kind of excess middleman payment systems in place that DeFi can replace and then create a much more efficient and enabled society for all layers. And so that's where I really think there's a lot of growth there. Um, as a maybe distant second is, I think there's a lot of uh, shipping and operations work that can benefit from blockchain uh, just I, I talked to someone the other day and he's an uh, author of a couple of books and a, a fund manager. And 
he said that, you know, if you're shipping something from, you know, let's say California to, uh, to Singapore, you're going to have to take the, the people picking up the item, then the people going to the port, then the port inspection, then the loading on the boat, then the boat unloading at another place. And maybe there's some intermediaries, then the port inspection there, then the customs inspection there, and then arriving and verifying it. And so all of these are often done by paper transfer of documents and not enough you know, scanning or verification. So the blockchain could create a seamless flow through all that process. And so think of any company that has those kind of processes or transfers in place, the blockchain would be a much simpler way of uh, managing that. So I think that was an interesting one. I don't specifically have much expertise in that sector, but again, distant second to DeFi, but something that's very interesting. It is very interesting. And when do you think that we will kind of see the seamless integration of blockchain industry into everyday life. So I would expect somewhere in the five to 10 year range still um, looking at the VC investment cycles over the last you know decade, you saw a huge spike up actually in 2018, I believe for VC investments. And then again, you know, your biggest year will be 2021 um, orders of magnitude bigger than 2018. And so those VC investments will probably take, three to seven years to come to fruition and really be enabled. But we saw, you know, I think hundreds of billions of dollars uh, invested over the last couple couple of years. And so once that comes to fruition and those are scaled up, I think that's when we're going to see the real transition to blockchain being core in our everyday life and in the systems that we're using that we don't even know is being used. Okay, that would be interesting to see. So to finish off, do you have any tips or tricks for newbie crypto traders? Yeah, um, I, I think a lot of the boring advice I would recommend being uh, do your homework ahead of time, you know, be prepared, find people. I think crypto Twitter is actually an amazing resource, but realizing who is a good resource and who is not a good resource is the difficult part. Uh, so try to do your homework and make sure that you're not following someone because they're popular, but because they're good. Um, and then trade with small amounts first, build a system and then scale up. And, you know, this is the hard part where almost every, you know, mega successful trader I know has blown up an account. You know, almost every really brilliant trader has blown up an account. And whether that account was 5,000 or 100,000 or, you know, millions, they've done it. And so avoiding that blow up by, you know, having your system, having your system be very rigorous and having your risk control be very rigorous is what's so critical. Um, you know, I hope everyone can do that because I knew the psychological damage that happens to you, your relationships, friends or family, um, and hopefully, you know, no worse decisions can come from any of these major losses. So, you know, there's so much opportunity out there, but you got to be careful on your way of getting there. You got to stay safe. You know, I mean, I hope if you're interested in learning about the sector, you just reach out to people, you network, um, you ask to, to make those connections. Cause I think the, the space is very supportive of each other. It's always looking to grow. And then on the note that it's looking to grow, you know, I think there's still a little more downside to occur in this market right now. You know, so we're August, 2022, as more downside comes, more people are going to be disinterested in the space and, you know, it's going to seem more painful and there's less opportunity, but that's the exact time to become an expert. Because when the next cycle comes around, you're going to have all this knowledge, all this background and experience, and you're going to show you have the dedication to stick with this through the tough times so that when the good times come, you are more prepared and able to take advantage of that. So, you know, reach out, connect and stay diligent. Yeah. And, you know, watch podcasts like this. <laughs> Listen, amazing podcasts like this. Best recommendation. And thanks so much for the opportunity. Really uh, appreciate it. Yeah, not at all. Uh, it's my pleasure. Thank you so much for watching this episode. If you enjoyed this content, don't forget to give us a like, comment and subscribe. If you'd like to trade crypto using some of Bryce's alpha, then make sure you check out Globe Exchange. Happy Globe trading and I'll see you next time. Thanks, Bryce. Bye. Thanks.